So these book chats have gotten a bit out of control, and I know it, and I'm reining myself in. Hi, I'm Crystal, and this is Stirred Up Book Club, a book club and chat for homeschool moms. When I started this book club, or when I first dreamed of it, I thought, I'm going to start out with a three-sentence summary, maybe ask a few questions, keep the videos nice and short so people can watch multiple uh, videos in a sitting if they want to catch up, or two a week is not that big a deal. Well, these videos have become about two to three times longer than I had hoped for. So today, I challenge myself to keep to the three-sentence summary but I have made a few compromises with myself. First, three sentences per chapter. So I today I get three sentences three times. Secondly, they will be compound and complex sentences. Lots of commas. And finally, I will allow myself to share a few extra details in order to frame questions properly. So without further ado, Let's jump back into The Strategy of Satan by Warren W. Wearsby. And today we cover chapters 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 8 is called What to Wear to the Battle. And this contains Wearsby's perspective on the notorious armor of God as outlined in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Wearsby's main point is that if we don't put on the full armor of God with five defensive elements and one offensive element, all, lots of commas here and dashes, <laughs> all within um, the paradigm of our dependence on God, then the part that we miss will be precisely where Satan attacks us. And finally, we put on this armor of God through constant, balanced, and watchful prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's where I get to add a few more details. Of the six elements, the belt of truth, which holds everything together, Wearsby says, the breastplate of righteousness, which consists of the righteousness of Christ imparted to us, the shoes of peace, whose purpose, um, which remind us that our purpose is to make peace, not war, the shield of faith, which um, we're reminded again that the object of our faith matters, that we should have faith in God and his promises. The, the helmet of salvation, which Wearsby describes as hope, as a defense against discouragement. And the sword of the spirit, which is a living, undullable sword. Which of these six elements are you the best at putting on, um, and which are you the worst at putting on? I think of late, I have be become better at putting on the shield of faith. Um, I, I have, I believe the promises of God a lot better than I used to. The rest of the five, I think I put them on um, partially but sloppily, and so they all tie for last. <laughs> so how about you? Let me know in the comments. And since I didn't start out with a verse, I wanted to insert one right here, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Chapter 9 is called Satan's Army, and Satan does not work alone. Rather, he he's master and commander over an entire kingdom of evil, 
wicked, unclean spirits known as demons. And this kingdom also includes the people that, um, that this army is able to demonize to various degrees. This kingdom and army is trained to deceive and destroy just like its master, both by overtly appealing to our lusts and by subtly posing as angels of light. Now, Christ invaded this kingdom and bound Satan, the so-called strong man, and we also have the ability to detect and defeat this evil kingdom through the, uh, through the understanding of the resources outlined in this book. Um, especially, Wiersbe says, if we don't succumb to two extremes. Number one, seeing a demon behind every tree. And number two, just dismissing the doctrine of demons altogether. For question number two, I'm going to start with a passage from the book, which is on page 144 of mine, my version. Satan and his hosts are organized. If only believers could be united in their defense and their warfare, Satan would not win so many victories. Sad to say, Christians too often are so busy fighting one another that they have no time for fighting the de devil. So question number two is, what would you say are the most important means of unifying the church? And I might be misunderstanding unity. You can let me know down below. But in my mind, it still starts with the individual and their relationship to God. Um, because if that is worked out, then the rest of it will fall into place too. And just for some encouragement, I'm going to put a short verse in here too. 1 John 4.4 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Finally, on to the last chapter of today's video and of this book, Satan in the Home. I think Wearsby finished with the home because that is where the gap between the individual and the corporate body of Christ is first bridged. Now, the ideas that Wearsby presents in this chapter uh, range from moderately to quite controversial for our modern day and are as follows. Marriage is God's will for most people. Two, the husband is the head of the home. Three, unfaithfulness in marriage implies problems at home and um, marital sex is one of the do's of marriage within the bounds of mutual consideration and um, with exceptions for temporary abstinence. And fourth, the wife's primary focus um, should be the home and nothing outside the home. That was just a wordy list. That's all sentence two, by the way. Finally, Wearsby's main point of this chapter, um, and I'm just going to read it, is that your home needs the same spiritual defenses as the individual. The inspired word of God, the imparted grace of God, the indwelling spirit of God, and the interceding son of God. Now, if this is the first video you've watched, um, I encourage you to watch the first four videos in this series, which goes into each of those in more detail. I'm not going to go over all the potentially controversial points um, in the questions here. I'm just going to choose one. But of course, if you want to talk about any of them, please bring them up in the comments and get the discussion started. Okay. 
simple question, I guess, with a lot of implications. What does submission mean to you? Now, in our household, um, I was raised by men, and my husband was raised by women, and a lot of times we feel like the natural roles of things have been reversed in us. Um, but my husband does want to lead, and I do find myself wanting him to lead, but it doesn't always work out very well. I had a pastor once um, describe submission as being sub or under a mission, meaning that the husband would set a mission for the family or household and the wife would submit to that mission. As I said, this hasn't always played out in a long clearly defined roles in our household. So I am really interested in what everyone has to say. I see submission as making space for my husband to lead, but maybe that's because I have a naturally overbearing personality. Um, I'm just interested in what you guys think about at least this topic or any of the other controversial topics. So comment below. Okay, I am going to put up a list of a more comprehensive list of verses um, for your independent Bible study. And then I'm going to make a quick announcement and wrap it all up. Okay, so the announcement is that if I do not attach a video on the end screen of this video, about March's t TBR, our book of the month for next month, um, then look for it to appear shortly in your feed if you've sub subscribed. If you have not subscribed and you're interested in um, following along with th these discussions, then um, please do so. If you like the video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If, there, if you didn't like it, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. Um, but more importantly, I really am trying to start a book club um, with plenty of discussion. And I would really love to hear what you think about the ideas in this book and the next. So thank you so much for watching.